up there we are it is uh tuesday the 15th halfway through the month of october already it is damp out there but it is a wonderful damp it is coming down so gentle and nice and soaking everything so well we need it and uh, i'm glad to have it may god bless you all this morning miss terry you're the first one up here this morning so i'm going to give you a Howdy, 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 howdy. It's good to see you and welcome with Brenda and Brent. I uh, love to see you guys up there. You are so special. May God bless you. Say hi to, to your dad, Miss uh, Brenda. We love him as well. Miss Nana, good morning to you and uh, to uh, Rick, your precious husband. We want to say hi to both of you. Miss Debbie, good morning to you. It was great uh, to get the text from you already, and uh, uh, God just beginning to raise up workers. It is kind of exciting to me to watch God at work. And there is Miss Angel along with, I would imagine, Miss Thena. So give a big hug, big kiss. She was so cheerful Sunday. Giggle and laugh, just wonderful. Miss Alyssa, good morning to you and to Master Cameron and uh, Miss Kara and Master Cody. It is good to see the three of you there, uh, or four. I'm, I know math was never my big subject in school, so uh, pardon me, but uh, Miss Sherry says, good morning, dear brothers and sisters. I'm grateful God has shared each of you with me. I just can't help but sing along. Neither can I. That's why I grab these and bring them in because they just, you know, kind of make the morning start right. Good morning, Miss Savannah. Big hug, girl. Good to see you. Be careful at work. You're on break right now, I'm probably. Mr. Daniel, good morning to you. You also be careful at work, please. And uh, there is Miss Laura. Good morning from all three of us. Send me a picture of the new member of your family, and I can post it out there. His name is uh, uh, Obi Run. Uh, 
I think it's Obi Run Kenobi, or maybe it's just Obi Run uh, Ruptax Straits, but it's Obi Run Kenobi Ruptax Straits, something like that. But uh, he is a beautiful, beautiful pup. Uh, hugs and kisses back from Tina. Thank you, Miss Tina. I appreciate that. I am so excited. I rejoice today for his giving me this opportunity. Such beautiful grace he affords me. Such beautiful grace he affords all of us. Great to see you all out there this morning. May God just bless each and every one of you. Got your Bibles. Got your uh, notebooks if you take notes. And I'm I know some of you do, so uh, get it together and open up to Acts 5. We're going to move on from where we've been looking at. Acts 5 is kind of a pivotal chapter. This is why we're spending you know, some time where we are. Because we're seeing a pattern set in Acts chapter 5 that we will see carried on throughout the book of Acts. So we want to get this right. We want to get it down. So uh, open your your Bibles to Acts 5, and we're going to start in verse 17 and read through down to verse 32. Uh, that, that embodies this next section. Uh, remember, uh, Ananias and Sapphira have uh, lied to the Holy Spirit, tried to trick, tried to steal glory. God, uh, well, they just fell over dead. We know that. They were buried. But the fear of the Lord spread, and the word of the Lord began spreading, and many multitudes were being saved. And not only in Jerusalem, but in the outlying areas, in the villages and towns around. Uh, that would take in probably Bethlehem, which is only about nine miles away. And all of these all of these communities and, and, and little places around Jerusalem, as the word spread, begin to come in, bringing their sick, their demon possessed, so that they could be healed. Now, this word is spreading like wildfire. And verse 17 uh, says to us, if I can get there, and I think I can, there. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, uh, now, remember, the high priest was a Sadducee, not a Pharisee. And uh, you remember some of the belief of the Sadducees. They didn't, they didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the, Holy, in the Holy Spirit, resurrection, none of this. Pharisees did, Sadducees didn't. So the high priest rose up along with all his associates. This is the sect of the Sadducees. And they were filled with jealousy. Uh, let that one sink in. So they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. Arrested them, put them in stocks and pillars, whatever, they, but they put them in a public jail. Uh, a place of, uh, where, they, where they'd be shamed uh, as criminals. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, <laughs> remember, Sadducees don't believe in angels. <laughs> So during the night, an angel of the Lord, I love that, opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go, stand and speak to the people in the temple. The whole message of this life. On hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together. Even all the senate the Pharisees and the and, and the Sadducees and and all the movers and shakers, if you will, that made up the decision makers of Israel. And they sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. They returned and reported back saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely. And the guards standing at the door, but when we had it opened up, we found no one inside. Can you imagine the shock of the guards at the door? They'd been there 
all night standing guard. They hadn't gone to sleep. Their life depended on that, right? But somehow, some way, these guys all vacated the jail and the guards had no concept, no idea. Nothing was disturbed. Everything was as it should have been, except there wasn't any uh, prisoners inside. Now, when the captain of the temple guard, the sheriff, the uh, uh, warden, if you will, the, the, the guy in charge of the jail, and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, uh, you, hey guys, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. And the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Can you get, get this picture? Come with me, plop yourself down, and get the picture. Here they are, out there, doing what they had been arrested for, preaching and, and, and teaching and healing and casting out all these things, and this contingency of police officers, of, of, of temple police, along with the warden, the sheriff, however you want to name him, the captain of the guard, come up and, uh, excuse me, excuse me, sir, all of you guys, would you please kindly come along with us? We would like to have a discussion with you. Now, they do this in, in, in a polite, kindly manner. Why? Because they are afraid that if they try to take them like they would have or like they did the day before, the people would stone them. When they brought them, they stood before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles, so now it's not only Peter speaking, it's, it, it's all of them, they answered, we must obey God rather than men. Please underline that or write it in your book as a headline. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He's the one whom God exalted to his right hand as the prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we're witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Now, that comment is a direct slap in the face of the, pre the chief priest. Whom God has given to those who obey him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the ability to, to envision this activity and what's going on. Lord, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen as just dry words on a page. It is living. It's vibrant. And if we can see with spiritual eyes, with the blinders taken off, we can envision the activity that goes on. We can see the heart and the motive of those who are bringing accusation against the apostles. We can see the uh, anger, the rage that is in them. 
the jealousy that inspires their hatred. Because the people should be turning to them and not the apostles. They've been usurped. And they know that, that God, you had removed from them and remove them from their place of lofty position. And God, teach us, reveal to us the, 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 the lessons hidden within this text, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, open hearts to receive, willing feet to go, mouths ready to speak. In your blessed name, amen. Okay, let's launch into this because this really becomes uh, uh, several lessons you know, given to us about uh, one, the extreme hatred that comes along with standing by the word of God, the courage that comes to stand when opposition comes our way. So we're going to talk about uh, enemies of the gospel. It just didn't happen in the first century. We, this is why I'm saying, this is critical for us to understand because we face the same things today if we will stand faithfully you know for him let's see we've had some clicks miss ruth good morning to you and hi to kenneth and there is miss linda love you it's good to see you there janine it's good to see you miss hickman and Teresa stewart yay get well will you kid we have missed you so please y'all pray for Teresa that she gets over this stuff and is back with us. We missed her, all right? Look at the verses 17 and 18. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates, uh, as a section of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy, and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. The message, oh, there, and there is Miss Jessica. All right, more folks coming on. God bless you, give a big hug and squeeze. Uh, to your mama. Good morning, uh, not only to Jessica, but to uh, uh, Betsy as well, and to Miss uh, Sadie. And there is Rick. Good morning to you. I saw Lena up above, and I see you down below. It's good to see you. God bless. The message of Jesus is spreading all over Jerusalem. And this is probably kind of a localized event yet, meaning this persecution and this hate-filled criticism of the impossible is probably only happening right there because we know that people are coming in from the communities. In fact, there's an indication that, that, that you know, they're starting to move outside the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, just, just, you know, Bethany and, you know, uh, Nazareth, or not Nazareth, but Bethlehem and, and in the surrounding area, Jerusalem, uh, you know, it's starting to break out of there to Judea, all right? Uh, so, but the persecution, uh, the hatred toward this message seems to be localized right now in Jerusalem. And the only reason we need to know this is because as we go through in just a couple chapters from now, this thing begins to spread all over. The word begins to spread, but so does the opposition. Uh, to this message. The apostles, the original followers of Jesus, started to go out to towns and villages to teach, but the high priests, the Sadducees, decide that they're going to stop the message from spreading. They're going to cut it off before it has a chance to take hold. They're going to douse the fire before it can spread. Our text says that they were filled with jealousy. And we need to understand this phrase because this phrase uh, said that it, it, it started deep inside them. And because it started inside them, 
they couldn't control it. It was a, a fire in their belly, this jealousy that rose up into great hatred. Jealousy is always going to act. Jealousy is always going to find a way to, uh, to break loose. And usually it's going to break loose in, uh, in anger, in, in violence, uh, you know, in, 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 in a lot of different ways, but none of them, you know, very good. Uh, and they are, are jealous to the point of, of rage. They are uh, uh, being controlled by it. That word filled, remember? Uh, means to be the under the influence, uh, be not drunk with wine, but be continually being filled, not with wine, but with the Holy Spirit. Don't be controlled, uh, don't be empowered by uh, and controlled by uh, alcohol, but be empowered by and controlled by uh, the Holy Spirit. Well, these men were empowered and controlled under the influence of jealousy. Have you ever known anybody to be under the influence of jealousy? Uh, I, I have. I've seen the aftermath of uh, people influenced uh, under jealousy. Uh, it usually leads in some way to a violent act. Either violence in the way that uh, uh, uses words to tear apart or destroy, or physically uh, used to tear apart. Jealousy is, is, is a raging fire, and once it takes control, watch out. They were jealous. Basically because more people were listening to these ignorant fishermen and were listening to these religious leaders and they couldn't stand it. Remember, they've already had them before them at one point. And remember what they said? They were amazed because these were unlearned, untaught, uncouth men. The jealousy was so severe. They decided to get very aggressive with it. In verse 18, they arrest these guys and they throw them in a public jail. Let me ask you, at this point in Acts chapter 5, what exactly have the apostles done wrong? Yeah, they are incarcerated uh, unjustly because there's nothing that they have done wrong. Now, yes, they were told not to preach or teach in this name again. And Peter and John were sent back. But they've already heard the words, is it better to obey you than God? You decide. They had just got arrested. They didn't do anything wrong. And this is what happens to you when you stand up for the gospel. Some people, when you stand on the Word of God, some people might hate you. They're going to hate you for no cause. They won't have any reason except that you love Jesus and you hold to the gospel. Now, they may couch that in, in a lot of other things, but it comes down to this. And if you've ever, they were told not to speak the truth. That's right. And and they did. I mean, they couldn't help but speak the truth. And when they did, they gained enemies. When you stand on your principles, when you stand on, on uh, uh, those inviolable truths that your life is built upon, people are going to hate you. It's kind of like if you stand for life, there's going to be a whole group of people out there that hate you. Now, are you wrong to take a stand for life? No, you haven't done anything wrong. Is they, Do they have a cause to, to hate you? No. So where does that come from? It comes from deep inside. 
these people. You have challenged, and this is something that, that, that you'll hear repeated, when you stand for truth, you always challenge the opposition. Because when you say, this is truth, you're also, by saying this is truth, saying that something else is untrue, because both these opposing propositions cannot be right. You know, there is a law here that says that uh, the two opposing positions can both be wrong, but they both can't be right. So when you stand for truth, you're going to upset people. And see, none of us want to upset people, do we? We all like to be liked. I, I like to be liked. But I can tell you that there's a whole lot of folks out there that don't like me. I know you find that hard to believe because I'm such a lovable guy. But that's not really the case. I may think I'm lovable and you may think I'm lovable, but there are some people because of the position that I hold, the, the truths that I present, the stands that I take don't feel that way. And I've had to learn over the years to be okay with that. Have you? Have you learned to be okay with people not liking you? These Sadducees and religious leaders wanted to make an example of the apostles, so they threw them in a public jail. This, this wasn't where you sent criminals. No, this is where you sent people that you wanted to make an example of, to get them to shut up, or at least to cause everybody else to say, I don't want that to happen to me. It's a public jail. Remember, they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. They were open to, dis remember, Sherry says, but those people are not our enemies. We are to love them and seek God's best for their life. That's right, and that's hard. That's why Jesus says, love your enemy. Listen, people, it is not you that they don't like. It's not you that they may hate. You just seem to be in the way of what they really hate. They hate the truth. They hate the light. They hate Christ. They, you know, it, they're in opposition to the word and to the word of truth. And they have no way to attack the word or the word of truth or, or you know, who truth really is. So it's you that they attack. Listen. They put them in a public jail. Remember the days when they used to put, uh, well, none of us were around when that happened. There's areas of the world that still happens where they, they put people on public display, put them in the stocks. Remember that back in, in colonial days, they would put people in stocks and people would walk by and they would, you know, I mean, they would put the drunkard in stocks and people would, would be uh, taunting them. They'd throw rotten fruit at them while they were, they may be there for a day or two days or three days. The object was to shame them to the point that they wouldn't any longer continue in that behavior or to be an example so people say, hey, huh, I don't want I don't want to be the next person in the stocks. This is what get your mind around it. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about some secluded place off someplace. No, we're talking about a public jail where they were open to public ridicule. To be set an example of, if you will. I don't think Jesus' followers were surprised by this because Jesus had already warned them it would happen, right? In John chapter 7, Jesus says, and the world is going to hate you. Why? Why? Why, Why did he say the world would hate them? I mean, they're, they're going to be out there spreading the gospel of love and of peace and of acceptance. 
and a forgiveness. Why would people hate you? You know what the answer is? It's very simple. The world's going to hate you because they first hated me. He's saying to his disciples, what have I ever done to inspire such hatred? Oh, let's see. I raised the dead to life. I healed the leper so he could go back to his family and become a productive citizen. I healed the lame and the crippled and took them out of the misery of their, uh, their life. I, 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 I uh, uh, healed the blind man, the deaf man, the mute. You tell me, what have I done to inspire such hatred? done nothing except stand for truth you see the day we live in I would challenge you to go out in certain ways I, I challenge you to go someplace and talk about gender identification and say there are only two genders biological males and biological females. Doesn't matter what medicine you take, it doesn't matter what surgeries you have, you have either biological males or biological females. Get down to the molecular level, check the DNA, you will have two genders, male and female, and just see what happens. I can tell you that any time that's addressed in a public way, even in this way, could I be canceled off of our medium? Yeah. Given the right laws, given the right uh, 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 algorithm, whatever, absolutely. <laughs> We might get stoned then. Yeah, well, there might be a way of stoning you even now if they could. I do that every day and people don't like it. No, they don't. No, they don't. Stanford Ruth. Say, marriage is between a man and a woman. Say, biblical marriage, marriage that is honored by God, is marriage between one man and one woman. and see what you get. Say abortion is, 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 is murder, taking the life of an innocent child and see what you get. Stand for truth. Look people in the eye and say, God loves you. You're a sinner. He wants to forgive you. what you get. Certainly there will be those that accept that message just like there were in the first century, but there will be people who won't like the message. And though they hate the message, they'll take the hatred for the message out on the messenger. So here's a truth. A truth that I think every believer needs to come to grips with. Are you ready for it? Here's, I think, the first truth in our lesson, in our, in, in our text. You can't and you never will be able to please everyone all the time, not even yourself. True state? It's a truth that we glean out of the scripture. And it's one that we have to come to grips with. We cannot, and we will never be able to please everyone all the time. There is only one person that we need to seek to please all the time, and that's our Lord, our Master, our King, our Sovereign, 
it is Jesus. There's the truth. How many of you have spent much energy in your life trying to make everyone in your orbit happy? Anybody out there would confess that that's me? I've done that. And then ask yourself, how successful have I been? And what has been the result of all of my efforts when they fail and, and it doesn't happen? What's the result in me? What does that do to me? All the time, Terry says yes. Alyssa says, I've done that. Debbie's got a raised hand. Daniel, I'm terrible at it. Fail miserably. Because we can't. You didn't fail. Please, people, get this discontent. Yeah. Get this in your head. You didn't fail. Because you have set out there, or someone has set before you, a proposition that is impossible to keep. So worry about pleasing the one. Usually, generally, when we see this idea that we have failed miserably, it's on us. Oh, I'm a bad person. I'm a terrible person. I, you know, I'm all of these things, all of these things. Don't you think that that's Satan's ploy to get you to retire into yourself, to intimidate you in such a way, to shame you in such a way that it puts you in a closet and shuts you up? Think about it. Sometimes we create more problems than we solve. That's right, Daniel. You can't and you never will be able to please everyone all the time. And I put in this, not even yourself, because there are times that we will think that we're working at pleasing ourselves and we don't do a very good job of it. What? Debbie, I need a little bit more clarification to that. Yes, that's right. What? Need a little more clarification on that. Because, you see, when this happens, and we're trying to please people and make them happy, and it doesn't happen, Thank you. I had not considered it that way. Okay. Then it bounces back on me. And it is attempt to put me in my place. See, the last thing Satan wants to have is bold believers out there who, in spite of the opposition, stand steadfast for the truth. Here's a secret to this. Look at the life of Jesus. Jesus didn't try to please everybody. Did he? He just tried, or did, his father's business and didn't worry about the consequences. He didn't worry about the criticism. It was going to be out there, and he understood it. People are going to hate me. And I want to prepare you for, as a Christ follower, you're going to follow me. You need to understand, because they hate me, they're going to hate you too. Now, not everybody, of course. But some. In fact, do you realize he really didn't deal with criticism at all? He didn't let it hold him back. He didn't let it get him down. That's exactly the kind of lesson that you and I need to learn. We learn it from Jesus. We see the apostles 
finally caught the lesson. Now, they didn't do it perfectly either, but they finally got the lesson overall. Did they not? I need to get that lesson. When they bring the criticism to Jesus, he just simply turned it around on them with truth. They'd fire him with lies, he'd just counter with truth. He didn't argue with them. This is truth. Expect it. It's going to happen. It's wrong. It's unfortunate. But it's still going to happen anyway. And it would even be worse if you and I didn't see it coming. But being forewarned is to be prepared, right? If you know it's going to happen, okay. You know, when it happens, I say, oh, I expected that. When you know you've done your very best, acknowledge your best may not always be another person's best. That's exactly right. Just do your best. And understand it's coming. Criticism will come. Opposition will come. And when it comes, recognize it and say, oh, I expected that. Okay, well, it's not going to blow me off. It's going to going to knock me off course. I'm standing firm and sure. So when they do start to criticize you, what do you do next? Well, next thing is to listen to the only voice that matters. Let Jesus be your defense. See, if you're living in a manner that allows Jesus to be your defense, you become harmless and blameless. Remember what Peter says, be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks the hope that you have in him, doing it with gentleness, right? Let Jesus be your defense. And on that note, we'll pray. Father, I thank you for the surety of your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you always prepare us beforehand for what may be right around the corner. And if we'll be mindful of that, Lord, we'll also know that around that corner, when we get there, you're already there. so we never lose our sure footing. God, when we hear the enemy throwing those words at us about how terrible we are, how rotten we are, how out of beat we are, how out of touch we are, or whatever they say, whatever comes at us, let us recognize the voice of the adversary and let us hear over that, that still small voice of Jesus that says, you're my child. Stand firm. Hold on. You're anchored in eternity to me. God, let us draw our courage and our strength from those truths. Let us learn to stand in the mirror and affirm to ourselves the truth of the Word of God for us. that affirms us and strengthens us and steadies us and keeps our feet on the solid rock that never is shakable. We live and serve in an unshakable kingdom. Though all around us is shaken to dust, we stand firm upon the unshakable rock. Thank you, Father. Give us the boldness and courage to face this day with unwavering surety. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It is good to have you this morning. Thank you all for your responses. Man, this was good. I love it when we have we have the interchange and that we can respond back and forth. 
nowhere together. And when a question comes, we're able to just address it. May God bless each and every one of you. Fill you full so that all the influence that drives you today will become from him. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow at 6. God bless you. Thank you, Miss Janine. Thank you. God bless. See you in the morning at 9.